Okay, the, uh, the idea here is to allow uh, structs and classes to be implicitly cast to other types, which kind of uh, completes the, the type system and the ability to create user-defined types. Right now, user-defined types can be explicitly cast, but they can't be implicitly cast from one to the other. And all that needs is uh, you just define those uh, functions with uh, the special names, and uh, the implicit cast should work. It also enables uh, uh, different kinds of implicit casting, uh, essentially uh, overloading on the return value of implicit uh, overloading on the re function return values. Um, it helps expression templates, and as uh, Andre likes to say, it avoids uh, abracadabras in the, in the code and other magic stuff. Uh, is this going to be a general kind of thing? Uh, can you overload on the return type of anything? No. Okay. So then, um, so basically this is exactly the kind of um, inconsistency that uh, guys like me try to uh, work around. Um, so probably this it will be in a different form because right now this like looks like incorrect decode, right? The name is special, so then the compiler is going to treat that function in a special manner when compiling. Oh, this function is allowed to uh, to overload on the return type, so it's more you know it's more, it's more equal than the others, right? Yeah, so well, the only reason that's possible is because it has no arguments to it. Right, probably we're going to take an out argument. So you're going to pass the receiver in the argument list, and that's going to solve the problem. Okay, I, actually, this is typical of our this, uh, Sunday discussions. So you know, <laughs> one of us comes with something, the other says, you know, this, is, as as, <laughs> as Walter likes to put it, um, Andre is the scientist. Uh, uh, he's the, the implementer and Bartosz the client. <laughs> and this is the, our triangle that we go through every Here, weekend. Just, we'll just, oh, did you get it? I think I did. Okay. Um, you know how you have a go-to statement? I've always wanted a come from statement. <laughs> <laughs> like right here, I want to come from someplace else. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so the problem we ran into is we have a class defined in some library we imported, or some other team made that class. In other words, we can't edit the class. But we want to implicitly cast from that class to our class. And we don't need to know anything about his internals, but we just want to be able to implicit cast from him to our type. So our version of come from is implicit cast from, another special function that you can pass a as a parameter, the uh, function you want to, or the object type you want to come from, and it will convert it to your, your local type. And uh, you can also use it for uh, changing calling conventions. So and in essence, like we have this thing here. Um, you know, arrays are kind of passed by, um, by slices are passed by reference. It's a kind of a pseudo reference because you pass the size, one second. You pass the size along, but uh, you alias the, the, the original array. Um, some people would say, I just want a, a monomorphic copy of this array. Uh, this happens a lot in scientific code when you have like a, a quaternion or a octonion or a point, a three dimensional point, you just want to pass it by value because that's the most efficient thing. Um, this template ideally would uh, manage to uh, use define op op implicit cast from uh, some array and be able to kind of deeply copy it uh, in its bowels and uh, simulate actually call by value when uh, the language only uh, allows call by refer reference for slices. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would have to be a, a static member function. Uh, just okay. Great. Okay. Um, Next one of uh, polysemous values, which we talked a little bit about yesterday. So we'll probably go. Uh, yes, sir. Um, there actually be another function called op explicit cast, which you know is referenced if you explicitly cast a function. So you'll be able to control 
in a class how things are implicitly cast from it and how things are explicitly cast from it. I'm, I didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions about cats? All right. Um, OPCast is more is still going to be more the explicit cast, and the um, implicit cast will be for the implicit casting. So unless it's implicit, it's explicit. <laughs> Not really. I mean, OPCast is explicit. All right, so yeah, we discussed this a bit. Um, there's plenty of uh, mixed type arithmetic in, uh, in CSC++. Think of this. Uh, shifts, um, mixed sign uh, additions and subtractions. Uh, what else? Um, modulus. What else? No, modulus, no. Oh, uh, the logical operators like uh, bitwise and, bitwise or, bitwise XOR, right? All of these. Uh, people would like to um, uh, to invoke on uh, guys of mixed signs, like you know, an int, a logical int, u int, and what's the result of that? Uh, probably half of this uh, this room would say, oh, there should be u int for some arbitrary reason. Probably this other half would say uh, should be int for uh, another arbitrary reason. The truth is, there's no real uh, rationale for making it either type. So we came with uh, this, uh, given that we believe this is a, a very uh, frequent problem, we came with this idea of polysimous types, which means the result, the ampersand operation uh, between a uint, uint and an int is going to return a value of a type that can fork to either int or uint freely. So you, you can imagine it as a user-defined type that has OP implicit cast to both int and uint, right? So they are kind of equally uh, favored there. So depending on what you put that value in, so depending on the receiver of that value, uh, you're going to be able to constrain the type. So it's kind of like a lazily evaluated type. And the, the type is, normally the type bubbles up from the bottom, and in this case, the type would actually come down from the top, how you used it. And if you use it in a context where the, the type can change the semantics, like if you're doing a comparison, then it will give you an error. Um, you'll have, um, if you were like going to add it to another type, it's not an error because it doesn't matter if it's signed or unsigned, you get exactly the same bits out. But if you get different bits out because of the sign, it will give you an error which will force you to cast to say whether you want the signed or the unsigned version. A little bit. It's 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 not. Um, it's a great question. It's uh, not really a union because the union does not have does not have the uh, the implicit conversions in. But yeah, you got you, you know you you got the feeling. Right, right. It's a union type. If that's okay, yeah. Right, so the, the, the thing is here, if you want to um, name a variable, uh, that's going to be a compile time error. Because, because it doesn't know what type to use. In user, land, in user land, you don't have access to that type. That type is in flight, is as long as it's on our value, it could be ambiguous. But when you try to actually stick it to a variable, the type system that you have uh, available is not gonna allow that. And we're gonna get uh, to hash values in a minute and you'll see that uh, again, you want the same behavior. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, we don't do both. I mean, it's it's one computation. To most people, it's kind of odd to realize that uh, when you actually add two numbers, it's actually relevant what the signs are due to the due, due to the properties of the two's complement representation. It's just the same operation. It's not. It's the same processor operation, and anything that happens, you decide later on what the sign and this should be. Right, it's how you interpret the result. It's not the result itself. The bits right. are exactly the same. They're exactly the same for a multiply, for an and operation, for an or operation. So you shouldn't need to worry about the type for that. 
it's the only time you run up your know, compiler will generate an error is when the type actually makes a difference. All right, so we've talked about this already. Um, I think we've covered yeah, all this. Yeah, we've covered this. Um, what, is, what is more interesting is that there's plenty of other places where you could apply this, uh, this polysemy. Uh, one is uh, a hack that's currently into the language. What if you look up a hash? Let's say you have a hash that maps strings to integers, and you look it up. Like you say, you know, my hash uh, brackets uh, blah, right? So what's the type of the result of that lookup, please? <laughs> An integer, right? Uh, what if the value is not in the in the hash? It's gonna throw an exception. Okay. Right? Uh, do you agree that I mean do, this? I mean, okay. I'm telling you that this is the current <laughs> behavior because you know associative array. Yeah. Now, if you look up an associative array, you say my array of string, and you put a plus plus in front of it. What's gonna happen? So it's pretty much like Perl. It's going to automatically create an integer, initialize with the init value of int, which is zero, and increment that zero, make it a one, and everybody's happy, right? Actually, let me use the whiteboard just for a second here, because I think this is an interesting example of how a hack could have very bad consequences. So we have, uh, let's say we have an int, can people see? All right. Can people actually read what I'm writing? <laughs> <laughs> okay, int of uh, string, uh, you know, x. And then I say, oh, sorry, this is a type. So int of string, x. And then I say x of s, and I say plus plus, right? So what's happening is that uh, the compiler is going to say, hey, uh, there is a plus plus here that requires kind of an R value, uh, an L value, so it requires kind of to increment something. So if this guy is not in there, it's going to be automatically inserted. Is that true? Yes. Okay. The witness has re replied. <laughs> <laughs> Please note. Okay, now what if I say, oh, yeah, this looks like that. What if I want to say, this guy plus equals one, just because I fancy plus equals more than plus plus. What's gonna happen now? The code should be semantically equivalent. It's not, is this gonna throw an exception? Right. It's by non-design. <laughs> it's by lack of design. So in, in essence, like, uh, Walter did notice that plus plus was uh, was useful and good, and put it into the language as a kind of a hack. under you know <laughs> as a little hack, right? Uh, however, people who see that they can assume that uh, this lookup is going to return some a value of some type, and that that type has enough uh, enough uh, stamina to be able to accommodate this plus equals one as it would have to accommodate the plus plus, right? Because they're semantically equ equivalent. Now, um, how, do poly how does polysemy solve that? By having the hash return a polysemy's value that could be, uh, in this case, int and ref int. So once it returns a, a polysemy's value that could fork into either of these guys, plus equals one is going to require reference, so it's going to fork into this, at which point it's going to be automatically inserted or if you want a read only, so if you only want a read, which would be, uh, you know, A equals X of S, right? In that case, the polysemous value is going to fork into int, in which case it's gonna throw an exception if it's not there already. Make sense? So it all depends on what I'm looking for. So I, I, I do a hash lookup. The hash lookup is returning me uh, kind of an electron is a, in, in a kind of a Heisenberg state, right? It's kind of, I don't know exactly what the spin is. Is it gonna be a reference, is it gonna be a value? Is it gonna throw something? What's gonna happen? I don't know yet. It depends on how I look at it. If I look at it as a reference, uh, which would be the plus, plus or plus equals or whatnot, 
In that case, I'm going to say, oh, you meant it as a reference. I'm going to insert it and do all the nice things for you. Uh, if I want to look at it as a value, for example, I want to print it, I'm going to look it up and throw an exception if it's not there. This goes for uh, other kinds of uh, sparse arrays that uh, people might be uh, writing, yes? Uh, what about if you said x of code f and code equals x of code f and code plus 1? Like you expanded that function to in, in that case, it's going to, uh, uh, first it's going to be a question if it's a defined operation. Because you want to do a read and a write kind of. It's an order evaluation right. issue. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, it, it depends on which way the order of evaluation is done, whether it throws an exception or not. So right. I would put that as um, implementation defined behavior. And it's something that I think that we ought to eliminate. We ought to define that the R value is evaluated first, and then the L value, and then it would be clear what but it I'm, does. That, that would not be left to right, but you know. Right. It's not left to right. <laughs> no, not. <laughs> OK, so <clears throat> another uh, issue that has uh, bogged many people, uh, spe especially library writers for a while, was uh, the type of string literals. So you have A, B, C. Yes, I see happy, uh, happy hand there. <laughs> um, a type of A, B, C uh, is really invariant car 3. Uh, dropping the invariant because it's uh, on the uh, first to last slide here. Um, let's say it's car of three, right? However, um, a function that expects a W car of three is going to uh, have to accept ABC because three characters do fit in three white characters as they fit in also in, in uh, uh, three double characters, like 32 bit, right? So uh, in current libraries, I understand that it's kind of um, very hard to overload functions on uh, car, w car, and d car to work properly uh, with string literals. So they force people to actually cast uh, string literals and stuff like that. Uh, it's very simple to solve this problem by making the string literal a polysemous value and say it's a polysemous value that could fork into three. Either it's a car three, d car of three, or w car of three, and the problem is solved very elegantly. Um, so I think um, yes, I, I think so. I think we're very uh, we're very happy, uh, pleased about this uh, the solution. It's going to be very applicable to a number of problems. Now, you already see polysemous support in things like uh, function pointers. Um, if you take an address of a overloaded function, it becomes sort of a thing hanging out in the ether until it's actually used. And when it's actually used, then it goes and attempts to figure out which of the overloads uh, match how it's used. And most people don't even notice when that's happening right. It just, it just works as you'd expect. Chris. Numeric constants? Yeah, I hope that, for example, like the constant one, my hope is that it would be polysemous, like, you know, it's all the way from byte to real, it could fit any of these guys, if that, that was the question. Yeah, so, you know, I hope that this is going to take some magic out of the compiler, because right now Walter is looking at the constant and figures, figures out whether it's going to fit in the size of a byte, uh, you know, short and so on. Uh, it would be much more elegant and uh, easy to just say any value that's uh, between, for example, 0 and 255 is going to qualify to be convertible to a u byte, and u short, and u int, and so on. Does that, make, does that make sense? Yeah. Well, we haven't really explored that, but it, it sounds like that's the way it should work. Uh, I don't like priority orders because people have a hard time remembering it. It's usually best to give an ambiguity error. <laughs> there are cases in which, um, uh, that being said, with which I agree, uh, there are cases, one second, there are cases in which you do want to have one preferred, uh, one primary uh, conversion, such as ABC would primarily be a card of three. So there is kind of a default type to it, as is for one in this, uh, in Chris's question, the one would be the default type is int. So if you just say auto x equals 1, 
it's not like, oh, I don't know, I can't decide for one. Did, did you mean a car or a, uh, did you mean a, a byte or a double or a and, real? And you need that if you're like passing it to a variadic function. Right. Okay, there has to be at least some, some yeah, default. So Otherwise, the language just gets too annoying to Yeah, so there's, use. A, there's a notion of one primary type and the rest are kind of, uh, kind of food soldiers. Uh, but uh, other than that, there's no more uh, there's no more corporals and stuff in the foot soldiers ranks. Seems like it basically you're just saying that it stays around the user until the moment when you can determine when it needs to be resolved into something real, basically. Um, yes. A, as soon as you want to put it in a named value, yes. So sitting out there, you're just and then suddenly it's now being yeah right. Recognized as going into something and you can throw something. When it right. when it needs there's, to have a type, it'll get a type. There. There's an earlier question. Is the first destination L value is the type that it's referring to? I think that is correct, yes. Yes. Um, is there going to, is, is this going to end up introducing um, byte and uh, short suffixes, like there's a long suffix? Words literal to one particular? Are those? Um, C's been around for a long time and hasn't needed them, so I would question whether they were needed. Okay, if if anybody can can demonstrate a real need for them, you know, we'll put them in. But yeah, it's a, it's a good consistency point. Um, we've been discussing it for a bit, um, and for completeness's purpose, it would be nice to be able to form a literal to any built-in type. Right now, we can't. Um, we can't throw a cast, which is kind of you know, people are going to grab for cast because they, they know cast is unsafe and it's going to be kind of a pointy hair boss, uh, a brow, you know, uh, brow, how do you, uh, eyebrow razor or whatever. So um, I'm undecided at this time whether it's a useful feature enough to introduce it for, for completeness or it would make the language too pedantic to be like, oh, we have the suffix, you know, uh, lowercase s means short, and uppercase uh, uppercase s means probably unsigned short, and I don't you know, all this stuff. So it it might be too complicated to be worthy. So okay, I introduced. Sorry, Walter. I introduced the slide as a kind of last minute addition. Uh, we've discussed for a bit uh, an issue about type information loss in arrays. Um, so we initialize a slice with a new something. Uh, all of a sudden, we've lost. In an instant, you've lost the static information whether that slice is actually an array or is referring to some portion of another array. Is, is it an actual array or is it a window into an array? Um, that makes for surprises from uh, beginners who kind of say, you know, I'm, I'm passing this array into this function and this function is, for, for example, appending to the array, right? And what's going to happen to, uh, after the function <coughs> returns on the, on the color side, the color side may or may not see a modified array, depending on whatever capacity the initial array had, which is kind of odd. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you know, I call, I call a function, let's say I have an array that has three elements and the capacity of like uh, 16. And the function is going to modify some elements, the first three elements of the array, which are gonna be seen on the receiver side because it's the initial array. It's gonna grow the, the array up to 16, at which point it's still gonna be visible in the original array. And all of a sudden the guy goes beyond the 16, uh, 16 bytes boundary, uh, elements boundary, at which point the array is silently reallocated and continues to modify the array, thinking uh, due to previous experience, the, the previous 16 modifications that things are gonna still go through. They're not gonna go through anymore. And the caller is going to be like, hey, you know, uh, you've done changes that I lost. And I'm seeing only parts of your changes. So that's kind of odd. Yes? You would. But because the resizable array is typed differently, then it's in the function signature and the parsing person using it, um, first of all, will know that that function is resizing the array. Second of all, is a slice is not implicitly convertible to a resizable array. So slice you can't resize. You can't say, uh, you know, um, what's that sign? Tilde. You can't say tilde equal, 
right? No. You can say slice equals slice tilled something, which makes it clear to everybody that there is a new allocation going on. But tilled equals is a whole different uh, ball game because it might append in place if possible, right? If there's enough capacity. So you can say slice equals some other slice. Uh, you can say array tilde equals uh, element, right? These are two very different operations. Uh, what you can't do is confuse the two, and yeah. that's going to be disabled. So a resizable array is implicitly convertible to a slice, but not the other way. Right. So you're not going to be surprised by your slice getting resized out from under you. Yes, there's an earlier question, actually. Uh, Chris? That's true. It, that's true. However, if the slice is never resized, this is a valid approach. We say I'm passing your window into my array, uh, play with it, and uh, I expect to see the changes. However, the guy can resize the thing, in which case it's undecided what happens. And this yeah. ha has happened a lot. People have, they've gotten a slice in, and they've manipulated the array, and they've appended to it, because it's something you can do with arrays. And it's there is, there's no protection against that, and it's always surprising. They go, something weird happened when I did this. And the only solution that we've been able to come up with to deal with this is to actually have two different types. One is a resizable array, and another one is an array that you can't resize it. And that way, it's not going to you know, jump up and uh, surprise people inadvertently. I, I, sure, you can. Um, the point is, uh, people are not. What I'm saying, I guess, is that uh, slices are, as they are right now. One second. Slices as, the, as they are right now, they allow for some unsafe manipulation that is bound to be uh, unpleasantly surprising. Of course, you can work around that unpleasant behavior, uh, but you know the nicest solution would be to kind of say, hey, we, you, we have. The, we have an array type, which means it's the beginning of array, and it's resizable. It controls a chunk of, of memory. And we have the notion of a window into an array, which is a scope with which you look into an existing array. So differentiating a static between these two types, I think, is, is beneficial. Yes, Thomas. Could we try to do that? It's, it's not possible. Because there's no way to tell the difference between a, uh, the owner, the original owner, or guy who allocated it, and somebody who takes a slice from the beginning. To the end. <laughs> to the end. There's no way to tell without adding more information and making it, instead of a fat pointer, and a, you know, a, a really fat pointer or whatever. And it's a, <laughs> Obese. Or, or you start thinking of, uh, Obese pointer. you start adding more data, and it was just, we thought, we need to solve this in the type system at compile time, not as a runtime check. So just on. Uh, but that doesn't work because you can take a slice from the beginning. Yeah, that, that's going to kill you. <laughs> uh, any problem you can head off with a type system at compile time, you're better off that way. And this way, it'll be clear in the function signature whether it's meant to be resized or not, and the compiler will check it for you <laughs> and so will prevent you from making basic mistakes. So one second before, uh, before uh, we uh, get to Bartosz. Um, this will enable most of existing slice-based code to work because an array is going to automatically uh, degenerate uh, to its, uh, to, to its super, super type, which is a slice. So an array, you can look at it as automatically as a slice from the beginning to the end. So if you have a function that expects a slice and you pass to it an array, things are going to work properly. If you write, however, a, fun a newfangled function that expects an array, you can't pa pass a slice to it and impersonate it as an, uh, as an array. Uh, one second, yeah, Bartosz. Well, we have these discussions briefly about uh, hash constants and tail constants, right? Uh, and so it would seem like um, maybe if you uh, pass the array or the slice of the hash const array, then uh, you wouldn't be able to modify the style. 
you wouldn't be able to rebind it either which uh, slice you should be able to rebind. So that doesn't work. It half works. Rebind the slice means I, I want to reassign the slice to a whole new thing, a whole new slice, like slice equals something else. I don't know, like, um, uh, in Chris's talk, there, is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of examples that had an op optional parameter, like this is a, some memory that was pre-allocated, and I, uh, I would allow you to play inside of it. And if that memory is null, then you would kind of uh, rebind the slice to some allocated, new, freshly allocated memory. So that would be a compelling, uh, you know, Uh, how so? Uh, I think it should work. Even so, as long as you don't uh, do tilde equals to the to the slice, uh, that's pretty much it. Oh, okay. And if you are doing it, you have probably made a mistake. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's yeah it's a, it's a, it's a risk of of. Uh, inadvertent changes. I, I think this change will break actually very little existing code that isn't already broken. Yes. Yeah, it's going to be, uh, become a compile time error. But changing dot length is still allowed? Um, changing dot length. No, dot length is a re changing dot length is a reallocation. You can re-slice. That's yeah. the example of rebinding, yeah. but you can't reallocate. So you only have to slice the same thing twice. So right. that's what you're saying. You could reassign a slice you could reassign a slice within the slice itself. Yeah, you can do that. And that only takes two options. Yeah, but you could you could do an explicit reallocation, right? Yeah. yeah. Manipulating dot length when you're trying to do a slice is the wrong thing to do because dot length is implicitly uh, changing the memory allocation. If you want to change your window, you need to do a re-slice, not, not change the dot length. So probably the slice in your example should be, uh, you know, if it's null, then uh, assign new card to it. There's no need to copy because you don't, I mean, you copy later, right? So it's just new car. All right. I think Kirk has a question. Yes. It'll, that, that's why most code will be unchanged, is because it will implicitly convert over to a slice. No, he talks about the, with a, a cast. Yes. With a you know the cast is the big hammer. You can you can do whatever you want. <laughs> You can make pointers and ints and uh, you know lead in the gold and all those things as long as you need it, as long as you have a cast. This question should not have come up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's right. why the QA department. We we should try to minimize the use, the need for cast so that the QA department can grep for the cast and then audit each one of them. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Okay, um, we were looking at the C++ as concept thing, and part of the part of the thing is does I want to specialize this template and only accept classes that have these functions uh, defined for it? And with classes, we already have that; they inherit from an interface. So you can define your template parameter as saying it must be derived from one of these interfaces. So we've already got half of concepts right there, already in D. Um, the other part is, well, what about structs? How do we ensure that a struct implements a certain set of functions? And I thought, well, why not inherit a struct from an interface? It won't actually inherit from the interface. What it will do is simply require that inside that struct, those functions specified in the interface are actually implemented. So a struct will not be castable to an interface. It won't be implicitly castable to an interface. It will not have a vtable in it. It won't have any virtual functions. All it is is just a way of saying, this list of functions have got to be implemented in this struct. 
And then it's a way in the template specialization to specialize on structs that implement these set of features that you need for the template to work. Yes, sir. Well, they'll get a compile time error. <laughs> okay. Um, you're right. Chris. Uh, you said it's not countable, but is it testable? Can you test the structs that you implement with a different language? Um, yes, at, at compile time only. At compile time, yes. It's more interesting runtime. Yeah, no, if you want to do it at runtime, you've got to use a class. <laughs> Class is set up for that, uh, constructs are not. Yeah. We'll make sure it works somehow. <laughs> Either with traits if we have to do it, or with temp a template with a specialization can be used to tell if it inherits from it. I mean, we can make it work. Yes, is expressions should do it as well. Well, one reason they're not is so they're compatible with the COM interface. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Interfaces really are, you know, COM objects, and all they are are a single pointer. And if you break that, then, then you've got another big problem, which is how do you interface with COM? So, yeah, it's a good idea. <laughs> Almost works. Um, there already is a special interface for COM, but I don't want to make it worse. <laughs> if, you inter if you inherit from ionnown, the compiler actually does a little mag magic to, in particular, the first three functions of a COM object have to be uh, add ref release and, you query know, uh, query interface. Uh, query interface, yeah, those three have to be there. So if you inherit from ionnown, the compiler in the background goes and makes sure those three functions are the first ones in the V table. Otherwise, the comma isn't going to work. Uh. So the point of it certainly should. Yeah. So now, uh, we didn't show the, the compelling, did we? Uh, no. Yeah. So we didn't show the compelling case, which is like what you really use the, these static interfaces for is in function template arguments. You say, you know, I'm, I'm going to take an argument of type T, colon, uh, it's got to be uh, addable, right? So you constrain the struct type to be addable. And uh, that's going to happen only at compile time. So that, that way you prevent the template from eating every, every type possible in, in the universe, which is what, what uh, C++ concepts were introduced for. for. Uh, in the words of a, of a living classic, uh, <laughs> concepts in C++, okay, don't tell anyone. Concepts in C++ are the dog that's supposed to eat the cat that's supposed to eat the mouse that was initially in the house. <laughs> Meaning that, with, you know, you start with a little problem and then you add more and more machinery to solve that problem, but uh, the machinery that, uh, that was introduced introdu uh, uh, turns out to uh, engender even more problems. So we hope to uh, not get into that, but we just got the line from the get-go, she's going to eat everything. So, um, uh, so yeah, this is the intended usage. Um, and the, the point being that it's, it's all for static checking, uh, checking sake. It's just to restrict templates from eating too, too much, uh, too, too many uh, values. Because if you just have a template, a function of one, one argument, that's going to be anything. It's going to eat any, any other argument. And you don't want kind of a function with a generic name like find to kind of uh, uh, swallow everything. Yes? Yeah. 
Okay, well, right now, this will be a compile time info. Uh, if you're doing classes, yes, you can do a runtime check for it. Because you can check interfaces at runtime, but structs would be a compile time. Yeah. Well, we need to work on the compile time introspection and then create a library which will turn it into runtime. But yeah, it's an area that clearly uh, needs some more work. Uh, one of the re motivating reasons that C++ needs concepts is you can't create a template in C++ but it only takes one type or a specialized type. You always have to have a primary template that eats all the types. And that problem isn't in D. You can create a template that only takes uh, specialized types. So half of the problem doesn't even exist in D. And I think that the, this will solve the other half of the problem in a, in a fairly straightforward way. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> we've been working nearly a year on const. And <laughs> It's the, you know, the, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like your, uh, <laughs> the black sheep of the family keeps showing up at the back door, you know. <laughs> uh, we have serious, uh, serious problems with cons that uh, we don't like any of the designs that are existing. And we did our first implementation of it. And, you know, it has a few warts. And so we're going to go back for... Uh, some fine tuning of that. Um, one of them is uh, the notion that when you have, like, let's say, a pointer to a pointer to a pointer to a pointer to a pointer, how do you treat const with that? And it turns out there's really two ways to look at const. One is the whole thing is const, and the other is everything is const but the front of it, but the first pointer. Those are really the only, and the third case is none of it is const. Those are really the only three uh, cases that need to be solved by the compiler because everything else can be uh, done from that. Oh, oh, in the case where the first one is constant and everything else is mutable. Now, it turns out that C++ const is the first one is const, everything else is mutable. Uh, that makes it impossible to do things like pure functions. Uh, C++ is seriously crippled because pure functions, as we went over yesterday, require everything reachable through your arguments to be immutable. And there's no way to write generic code in C++ because you can't just say const on your generic type and have it be const because it only applies to the first part of the type, none of the types underneath. So what we've come up with is the idea of when you have a list of things, you can view it as the whole list, the head of the list, or the tail of the list, sort of a lisp-like thing. So with const, what we want to be able to do is manipulate the constness of the head and the constness of the tail. And with those two things, we can do everything. Now, there are also two kinds of constants. There's a constant view, and then there's invariant. So what we're thinking of doing is having final be const of the head <laughs> and const be const of the tail. Uh, before anyone kind of uh, add the third <laughs> point or two uh, that Walter said, uh, kind of last interest to start looking on the window. Uh, this is <laughs> <laughs> so this pointer to pointer to pointer to pointer to situation is a simplification on a, on a ver of a very uh, Common, commonly occurring uh, real life situation. I've never had like more than three pointer to pointer, right? But you, may, you might have some object that has a field that is a pointer to some other object that has a field that is a pointer to some, some other object. And that could go for five, you know, five of these hops very easily, right? So, but 
what Walter says is compiler lingo for a compiler writer lingo for that situation. There is the same thing. They say pointer to pointer, pointer to two. Uh, what really happens is that in real life is that, oh, I have a structure point that has a pointer to a color, and the color has a pointer to uh, RGB, and the RGB has a pointer to the display or whatnot, right? So it's a very commonly occurring situation. So now, um, uh, think of pure functions now, uh, just to clarify a point that Walter made. Uh, think of pure functions, so you pass arguments into your pure functions, right? Uh, they become private data of the pure function. Therefore, the pure function is able to modify it, can play with it, can, you know, can change it at will. Do you agree? I pass an int to a pure function. That becomes private on the stack of the pure function, so the pure function is, uh, is free to manipulate it. However, it would, uh, if I pass an int star, the pure function would not be able to manipulate anything that the int, points, the int star points to because that's not anymore its own private data. So that's why we're talking about the head and the tail of the of a kind of a chain of pointers because a pure function can play with the head of the of a chain but can't never uh, can never uh, play with the play with the tail uh, just as well so that's why you need uh, these all flavors of oh I want this guy to be um, uh, constant at the first level and everything that's referenced is uh, you know it's not const or I want uh, the opposite situation which I can uh, modify, mutate the first level, but I can't mutate anything beyond that because I don't own it. Uh, yes? Is there any rationale for these two words? Uh, there's, <laughs> I'm not sure. That's an excellent question, and, and uh, we have been racking our brains real bad with finding a good terminology for, for the, these flavors. Um, like foo and bar, foo and bar, that's a good one. Yeah. There's, there's, really not, there's really nothing that, that's going to please everybody. Uh, no, the, as of now, we have nothing that's going to please everybody. We're looking, be sure that we're looking for something that's going to be easy to, to remember because you know what, I don't remember them. Yes? There's that issue that might uh, that might have to give way somehow. Yeah. Also, maybe, there's maybe we should like, tell everybody about this. <laughs> right. Um, if we find, let's say we find we find the, the great American scheme. If we do find that scheme, then uh, everybody's going to be like, you know, the hell with the the previous const. We love this, right? <laughs> God, so help me God. <laughs> okay. So um, now. There's also existing semantics for const in C++, which is like kind of first level const. There's semantics for, for final in Java, which means uh, the references const is, again, it's kind of first level const. Uh, so we also must play nice with, uh, with those less other people coming from, uh, as refugees, political refugees from other languages are gonna be uh, confused. Making Cons right now apply to the tail of whatever type it's given, right. not to the object itself. But everything it refers to will be cons. Well, one possibility is that so it depends on what's the most often encountered. Probably const could plausibly be you know what if I say const x that applies to the head and the tail if that's the most uh, frequently occurring situation. Uh, maybe then it, there's kind of uh, just one const without the head, just const without the tail, and so on. So. We are looking for a good terminology, so if you guys have ideas, just let us know. Um, yes? Give it to the man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're very common words, so it's, it would it be... It would have to be a context-sensitive keyword. You could make const head, const tail, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, if there's an obvious one, we haven't found it, because all the ones we've looked at are, uh, we, we, we know where we want to get to, but we haven't figured out how to get there yet. But anyhow, um, this has gone on for nearly a year, and it's going to keep going on. What so. if we finish it in five minutes right now, and everybody's happy, yes. Yeah, if you have a struct, the head is defined as the body within a uh, size of struct. 
uh, size, as a struct that size. Think of the head as this way. If you go A equals B, that copies the head. Okay? Anything you would call a deep copy is the tail. So the head are just the bits you can manipulate by passing it to a function, copying it. Those, that's what we call the head. The head type refers to that. What, Chuck? Yeah, well, it's like in Lisp, you have CDR and CAR, except I never remember which is which. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, well, if, if anybody uh, thinks about like Lisp, it makes perfect sense, because in Lisp, you're always dealing with the head or the tail. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> Lisp is a very powerful language, and it, it just has a horrible syntax. It, no, it just has no syntax. It has no syntax. It's an AST. Okay, so I, I suggest we blow forward because we could sp uh, we spent a year already, so uh, <laughs> five more minutes are not going to make much of a difference right now. Oh. <clears throat> okay, so all right, so simplifying code, we're going to go through a number of features that are valuable inside function implementations, not for kind of uh, large scale design or anything. So it's pretty simple. Uh, the, the first one is, uh, let's say I have a, f uh, a function that takes a couple arguments, and one of those arguments happens to be a literal. A classic example would be like uh, a power function. Um, I would like to constant fold that constant inside my function. I, I want to create a specialization of that function for my constant parameter I'm passing. So what Andre came up with the idea No, of, not me, Dave. It was Dave's idea? Oh. He came with the head, I came with the tail. <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, it wasn't my idea. <laughs> so normally, we'd create this uh, template function to do it, where we move our constant parameter out and make it a template parameter. And so the idea came about, Dave, <laughs> of why not create a special storage class in the function declaration itself to to basically the same thing as if I'm creating a function template. In other words, it makes function templates even easier to use. Um, it turns out that a little bit of syntactic sugar like that can really turn a feature from uh, nice, but I can't figure out how to use it, to boy, this is convenient. I use it all the time. It just makes it really sweet. And then it will overload against the function that takes, that um, like. that takes the dynamic values for it. But it will. It will prefer the one with the static or the. Um, it could be any of them. Any, any of them. Um, it's killer, killer application for the sorry, Walter. Killer application uh, formatted right. The first parameter is the format string. If that's a constant string, you can check it out compile time. Otherwise, you do the slower runtime check. Yes. Absolutely. So that's the idea. I call printf or writef with a constant string. In that case, it's going to be uh, funneled through an overload that's going to understand it's a constant uh, compile time string, which is going to possibly invoke a macro that's going to do a lot of the work during compilation. It's going to essentially partially evaluate the format string, right? And it's going to be, yeah, so it's going to be type safe and it's going to be type safe uh, check during compilation. Yeah. If the string is uh, dynamically uh, known, then you, uh, it's going to get followed through the other overload, which is kind of a classic route function. It's going to do the uh, dynamic uh, checking. So um, uh, I think this is going to be a feature that's, that's, very, uh, that's very useful. Uh, it's really going to be able to t take existing functions and speed them up just by specializing them on uh, constant arguments. Well, <laughs> no, actually, that, that, that's that a great idea point. has come up. <laughs> that's a great point. And, in fact, um, Andre Yell says, why don't we fix the slides so it says const there? <laughs> so in, in short, uh, what I, but let, let's wait for a couple more slides. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, I've talked a couple times about trying to improve the reliability of D by making it more portable, by eliminating implementation-defined and undefined behavior as much as possible. 
And one area ripe for doing that is uh, the order of evaluation of function arguments. People expect them to be evaluated from left to right, except you know they're often evaluated from right to left. And even I sometimes have to go you know check the manual to see on this kind of function is it evaluated right to left or left to right. So we were thinking of just simply always evaluating them left to right. Every once in a while, that will require the compiler to generate a temporary to make that work. But uh, I think that the small runtime cost in doing that, in the rare case when it happens, is will be worth it <coughs> to achieve the portability. Java does, and I have some experience with Java doing that, and it doesn't hurt to do it. Oh, OK. <laughs> So but, by the way, this is not all, uh, like if you imagine you want to evaluate arguments and push them on the stack and stuff, right? So ideally, you'd, put, you'd evaluate the last argument first. Um, actually, this could still happen. So you don't have to evaluate the arguments uh, left to right. You have to make it look like you uh, evaluate the arguments in that order, which means unless they have um, side defects, which Walter has a flag in the compiler, he, he can he detects whether an expression uh, actually does have side effects or not, so there is a flag. Uh, unless one of these expressions is going to actually have side effects, he can do whatever he wants because you're not going to uh, be able to check it. And remember, pure functions don't have side effects. So that's that's just another reason to have pure functions. That doesn't look like Java. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, actually, uh, sorry for the mix-up. That was the oh. second slide after the, uh, you know, after the slide with uh, the overloading uh, on static. So that's exactly the printf example. So if you evaluate, oh, I have a laser. So if you have this um, full get chart, the prototypical function that's going to never be evaluated during compilation, right? Uh, so if you pass get chart and y, it's going to call the overload that, uh, that has the dynamic value. Uh, but if you call it with a constant here, in this case, 3, it's going to um, uh, fork into this other function so the overload is going to be exactly what you'd expect. All right, the feature that, um, why don't you go ahead? OK. Um, currently, C++ works like if you define members of an enum, they all get exported into the enclosing namespace. And that's very convenient, but it also causes uh, name collision problems. And D has the opposite thing. Their names in an enum are in their own scope, and when you want to use them, you have to qualify the name with the enum name. And what Andres proposed is that they be sort of conditionally exported into the enclosing scope, which means that if it's unambiguous, you don't have to qualify them. If it is ambiguous, you do have to qualify it. So it kind of... It's like a function pointer. It's like function pointers. It, it just, um, it, you probably won't even notice that it's doing that, because it's just going to do what you expect it to do. Like in this example here, very easy. Just a second. Uh, in this example here, very easy. Um, uh, you open a file, and you just specify I want to open this file in writing mode. Um, you know, in today's day, you would have to say file, file upon mode dot, dot write or whatever. Um, you just say write. And that allows you to specify kind of pseudo keyword parameters to functions. Very convenient because many people kind of use Booleans for that because they hate to define yet another enum uh, for yet another kind of little parameter that they want to pass. Uh, this is going to allow you very easily to kind of say, I just take this uh, enum, of, could be even anonymous, and it's going to be properly bound. You just say the pseudo keyword, in this case, right, and it's going to work. Yeah. Uh, Kirk? Hmm? It's going to kill the existing file. Uh, thanks for the, <laughs> seeing the joke. <laughs> so, Kirk. That's interesting. I hadn't realized that. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, and in C++, people get, get 
sick of it, and they put prefixes on all their names anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, My hope is that, yeah. My, my hope is that, we're, yeah. My hope is that we're going to get to that point. For example, a function. Essentially, there are many functions that need to specify pseudo keywords, such as you know, I want to open this file in, in whatever mode. I want to do an SQL statement that's going to you know, be inner join or outer join and whatnot, right? So, in essence, the function ideally should be able to say right in the definition, which is here. Uh, instead of open mode, which is a named enum, should just be able to say crank the enum right in there in the body of the of the parameter declaration as an anonymous enum. That's going to be words that have meaning only for that function. That is great. Yes. Right. So. Yeah. So you mean move this guy inside the class file? Yes, and uh, so that's one step, and the second step would be to even make it anonymous, so such that it only has meaning for the constructor. Uh, uh, your solution would be good when you want to re look at the open mode later on. So what mode did I open this file in? So you do, do have to have a name for it. Okay. It, it's a small feature, but it's just time out. I need to pause for a second to change uh, the recording medium. <laughs> oh. Okay, anybody have anything to say they don't want on tape? <laughs> <laughs> Off the record. Any more questions on this picture? Sorry? Yeah, that, this is just one of those, those little things that just makes life, life easier. It's not a big deal. So the switch statement on in the case you don't support it by an author yet? Yeah, so as long as uh, it's bound at the receiver value, yeah, yeah. So as the the switch already binds the labels because they're, you know the, the the type statically, so th that's going to also be unneeded anymore. The prefix, so you're in good shape. Uh, Thirty-four out of fifty-seven. It <laughs> Why don't we do macros next? Because that seems to be on everyone's yeah. list right. of things they want to hear about. Um, we don't have much on reflection. So. <laughs> okay, you want to skip the macros? Yeah, let's skip the macros. Okay. All right. It's like two more down, I think. Level one, I implemented like you know the auto join whatever you know, so I don't think it's a it's a very good idea, um, and besides, I mean think of the const thing, uh, the const thing is absolutely know? huge, absolutely out. hard to implement, uh, absolutely disgusting for people to learn. We all hate it, but it's absolutely necessary for things like parallel development. If we don't put that in, we lose the train on parallelism, you know, and also. Uh, if you look at the papers in the last 10 years, you're going to see that Java's favorite indoor sports is finding an implementation for const. Yeah, we're not the only ones struggling with this. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. Like You see papers at the best conferences in the world on how to implement const for Java and discussing all the issues and all the stuff. And that's because uh, Java chose to not implement const. There is a need for it in large applications. Uh, it's just, it just so happens that people communicating over uh, large code bases, they need to carve their interfaces with enough precision such that they, uh, they, they work properly. And CANS is one of those precision tools that allow you to say this module controls this data and no other module is going to be able to, to yeah. mess with it. I'd be the first person to just get rid of CANS completely if we could, if we could do it. I did. Yeah. It's more than that. I mean, what, what you're seeing is, uh, is the, the, the current, uh, our current best idea. We are not sure it's going to work in all cases. For example, how do you type check the constructor of, a, of an invariant object? We, we, we don't know. We have an idea. We don't know if it's going to be practical, if it's going to be enough, if it's going to be too restrictive. 
So there are very many uh, uh, ugly details that need to be taken care of, especially when, when you take this transitivity into, into account with, with uh, which very few languages uh, deal with at all. So um, it's very complicated. Yeah, but doing it right is the key to getting parallel programming to work and make D work as a functional or parallel multi-threading, all that stuff. It's just really important to get it to work. But and you yeah. had a question like much earlier on. Did no, I <laughs> I know all about un unimplementable <laughs> compilers. <laughs> okay, um, macros in their simplest form uh, look a lot like functions. You notice uh, foo is the name of our macro, it takes an argument e, uh, e equals three is the body. There is no return value because what macros do is they substitute the syntax. There's no semantic analysis going on inside of a macro. It takes its arguments as syntax and simply plugs them in to uh, matching names in the, uh, in the body of it, and then that body replaces the macro invocation. So if we invoke it with a foo of star q, star q is actually a syntax tree with a star connected to the identifier q, not the symbol q the identifier q. And then e equals 3 is identifier equal sign 3 literal. There's no types, there's no symbols, it's just simply those three things. And it replaces the e with the star q, then it does the semantic analysis of it. So functions, normal functions, do the semantic analysis inside the function based on the types of the arguments. Macros, the semantic analysis happens after the macro is expanded. Um, that's why you can't overload macros with functions, because in order to overload the function, you have to do the semantic analysis on the arguments. Well, uh, if it turns out to be a macro, you're not supposed to do semantic analysis. You're just, just supposed to take the syntax. So. It's just simple replacement. In fact, it looks very much like if you went hash define foo for C, for C which does a text substitution. But it does, it does, it does respect all the evaluations. You may want to go over that. Like, does it replace the subtrees? That's true. In C, in C++ with text substitution, if you have uh, A divided by B, or foo, let's just write it down. <laughs> foo over, you know, b, okay? Now, foo, if foo was a text macro in, in c, you'd wind up with uh, 3 plus a over b, which is then parsed, and it's parsed like that. And that's kind of the classic problem with text substitution macros. D, on the other hand, is replacing syntax trees. So the syntax tree for this looks like So imagine the full macro be, being defined as 3 plus A. Yeah. A. Okay, so this is what our syntax tree looks like for this, and this call foo with <coughs> three is snipped off. So we erase it, and we attach it to three plus. Oops, that's an e there. We replace that with. Uh, with that, and then we do our argument replacement, and we snip off the E and replace it with 3. So this, if we linearize it, it's uh, 3 plus A over B, and our parentheses wound up in the right spot. So this is the difference between uh, syntax tree manipulation and uh, pure text manipulation. But the important thing to remember is 
This is a syntax tree. There is no meaning to these symbols at all. This B is not the symbol B, it's the identifier B. It doesn't turn into symbol B until after semantic analysis. So where's yes, the cat for this? Question. Oh, that, that's a great point. Um, macros will be able to define their own uh, values. Actually, it's it's uh, well, next slide. Go ahead. Let's let's do that, and we'll we'll see what happens. Let's uh, macro foo of e e plus e. OK? Now we're going to go foo sub i plus plus. What happens to that? Well, this syntax tree is called foo plus plus i. And we're going to snip this baby out and replace it with plus. E, E. Then we're going to do our argument substitution, snip these guys off, and put plus plus i, plus plus i, and voila, you're going to get two increments. Um, that's a long uh, way to say yes, there is a speed, the pitfall does remain, but macros can define their own private symbols, uh, which can, they can bind to whatever. So you can have, in this case, a uh, foo. May. Where did I put it? It's up there. So in this case, you can uh, simply say, uh, you can say, uh, you know, final A equals E, uh, A plus A. Right? Something like that. In fact, this, uh, if you want it to be an expression macro, just say this. So it's a comma expression. Uh, by the way, in, in, uh, in D20, Expressions are allowed to define variable or to define symbols. So you just define a symbol to bind to this guy, and they return the, the sum. So in this case, you're you're only going to do the the increment once. Uh, symbols defined inside macros are not going to be visible outside, right? Free symbols uh, that are used by a macro are not going to be uh, are not going to be uh, accessible to the macro. So we're going to get go, get to this right. Soon. But before that, let's uh, let's talk about pattern let's matching. Have fun with pattern matching, and this is how uh, you can uh, specialize a macro to work on only certain types of syntax trees, which actually enables you to uh, to parse um, to parse syntax trees. Where's that lovely laser? So that's supposed to reduce dance code even more. Okay. Well, here's our our default, which. Uh, as sort of a bucket for everything that doesn't fit a specialization. And here we take an expression, or a syntax tree, I should say, E, which is specialized. It must be of the form E plus 1. So it'll match any tree that looks like plus 1 something. Anything will match that. So you see, it, it quite nicely uh, captures anything that looks of that form. And E will give us the sort of the left side of the match. So if I just have the argument or the syntax tree 3, it will match this. And if I have 3 plus 1, it will match this. And E will be replaced by the 3. So uh, in, uh, in Don's case, he had the uh, expression uh, A plus equals uh, B times C, he could write a macro that captures just um, expressions of that form, and then he could have his special ASM code just for that, or a call to a special library for that. Um, X plus Y plus 1 matches 2, because this is parsed as X plus Y plus 1. 
So the x plus y becomes e. Uh, 1 plus x, although it could be transformed into this, it doesn't match. This is 1 plus x. That's e plus 1. It's not a match. So this will match this macro up here. And x plus 3 minus 2, although 3 minus 2 constant folded equals 1, you would think it would match that, but it doesn't. Because remember, constant folding is part of semantic analysis. Well, this is only manipulating uh, syntax trees. There's no semantic analysis. So this goes and matches uh, this one up here. Yes, if your macro was matching e plus parentheses 3 minus 2, it would match this. But would it match for the other one? Like 3 plus 1. Do you do constant folding on the specialization, but would it match 3 plus 1? No, the specializations are also syntax trees. Yeah, so you, you essentially match trees. You never match, uh, see you, Chuck. Uh, you never match like full expressions. Yes. Yes. Oh, uh, that's uh, well. Then you have the idea of concept of a uh, better match. Um, just like in templates, the matching types, you if you match more than one, but one match is more specialized than the other, it will prefer the more specialized match. Yeah. So actually, uh, a nice point to make here is that. Uh, Macro, this pattern matching on macros on, and DSTs works absolutely, not absolutely, almost exactly as um, pattern matching template types in templates. When you have a template and you say colon and it must, the type must have this shape, right? It must be a hash uh, keyed on a, another hash keyed on an array of whatever, right? So it could be an arbitrary complex type. Which in, uh, which in essence, if it's for me, I'm, I'm busy. Okay. Um, which in essence is... Um, hey, Trish. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Vacation it, could be an arbitrary, it, it could be an arbitrary co complex type, which is actually a tree. And here we have a tree as well. The process of matching these is exactly uh, the same. It's tree unification. It's easy. Um, so this is kind of part of the rule of the least astonishment, which, which says, you know, if uh, these guys behave this way uh, and these guys are the same kin as these other guys, trees, then why don't we uh, handle them um, uh, similarly? So we just see. like with templates, you can, you can pick apart a type with a template specialization. You can pick apart your syntax tree using a specialization. Yes. I'll try. I don't know how well it's going to work. It's probably not going to work very well. It, it, it's a hard problem. So it, it, I know a guy who wrote a PhD thesis on that, and he got away with it from Brown. So I guess it's a good, it's a hard problem. Yes, there's a question, Yon. All right, uh, that's a very good question. Um, what happens is during the semantic pass, it's, it sees that uh, call foo plus plus one, and it's told semantically analyze this. Okay, analyze this. so it looks at the left side and oh, it's a name. Looks up the name. What is the name? It's a macro. Oh, I don't semantically analyze the right side. I go expand my macro, substitute the syntax tree, and reinvoke the semantic analysis on my new tree. So the, so the answer to the story here is it's done during the semantic analysis. Yes. Yeah. But the but also the semantic analysis on the arguments is not done until after the macro gets expanded. Uh, 
Um, I hope to avoid those problems. <laughs> I like to have the control. <laughs> okay, we, yeah. Uh, the, a very good question is why can't you do this in C or C++? And the reason you can't do it is because you cannot parse C++ without doing semantic analysis. So you wind up with this chicken and egg problem. You could right. probably make this work. It's just, I guess, nobody seemed motivated to do it. Um, I think there's one or two cases where you can't, like a cast, but it's close enough. Okay, uh, he's um, um, uh, coming back to a previous point of mine. Um, uh, there's this uh, highly discussed hygiene problem in, in the Lisp, Lisp community, which is probably the most uh, macro-intensive community uh, of all languages. Uh, the hygiene problem is the following. What if you have a macro that uses, for example, a free symbol? It uses the symbol x. And at the point uh, the macro is defined, x was not known. Right? That means whenever you expand the macro, it's going to capture whatever x uh, is in the, its context. Right? This is exactly what, what C macros do. If you have a macro that uh, says x plus 1, that expands to x plus 1, it's going to capture whatever x is in the context of, of its uh, evaluation. Uh, that's a kind of non-hygienic thing, because it would make it impossible for it to look at the macro and see what it does. So um, the list community has come uh, after a very long debate that's still uh, raging with the, the hygiene uh, concept, which is the following. If, you, um, if the macro def defines its own symbols, then they are confined inside the, the ma macro that are invisible outside. So macro cannot actually spawn new symbols. That would make compilation uh, s sensitive to the expansion of the macros, uh, actually parsing itself. Because then you see a symbol, it could be anything. Um, and names uh, caught uh, read by the macro uh, cannot be, uh, are going to be looked at in the context of macro definition and not expansion. And I'm going to give a couple of examples um, on why that's bad. Uh, because too much hygiene is not fun, and here's an example. So imagine you want to uh, define a macro foo, and you have uh, it's going, you're going to write whatever expression received, the symbol x, the symbol dollar x, and the tree x plus x, OK? If you invoke test now, what's going to happen is that you have one x that's in the local context, in the context of the expansion of the macro, and you also have an x that's in the context of the macro definition. Which is which? By default, you play it safe, so this x binds to this x. Make sense? If you want dirt, you're going to put a dollar in. Money are dirty. So this dollar x is going to bind to this x. It's going to be sort of dynamically bound in the point, at the point of the instanti instantiation. And also here, dollar is, uh, in this dollar context, x plus x is going to be bound again twice to uh, this guy. So we're going to see uh, 7348 as the expansion. Yes. We'll send you a bill for five dollars here, only. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make some money. <laughs> so um, I don't know. <laughs> Actually, yes. uh, the line is looked up very early in the Lexing phase, and you're just going to—it's just going to be a no-op to have the dollar sign there. Uh, this dollar thing. Uh, uh, actually, the next slide shows a pretty nice uh, example. Um, 
it's very convenient to have uh, things like uh, the so-called interpolated strings in uh, many languages, such as Perl and PHP and uh, probably other uh, scripting languages. Friends have a function that's, uh, that uh, that's just prints uh, text interpolated with variable name, names, right? So you have, uh, we have here like three interpolated names, A, B, and C, and they are in the context of the macro expansion, not of the macro definition. So in that case, the same macro will have to actually look at the string, slice and dice it properly, look for dollar signs and all that good stuff, right? And at the end of the day, it's going to must, uh, it's going to have to look up A, B, and C in the context of the expansion, so that's dirt. So that, that would be a dirty thing to do. However, it would be a useful thing to do. Yes, it is a literal this, string. This is a literal string. The, yeah. mac the macro is going to do all the parsing, uh, parsing a string for you, and it's going to expand it into a write FLN call, write F call, that's going to you know, in mix variable names with strings, with variable names with strings and stuff. I should have written this, actually, the expansion. So the expansion is going to be write A, comma, musketeers computed, uh, comma, B, comma, to B, comma, and so on, right? Oh, the, uh, yeah, this. Yeah, this is the kind of example that the compiler writers revel on because it kind of makes things complicated. In, uh, These are test suite examples. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It would be redundant. It, it would. It'll be a no op because you've already instructed it to look inside the local <laughs> scope. Take off, the outer, the outer. Take off the outer one? Yeah. Take off the outer one. Let's put it to the inside. Right. Then one of them will be looked up in the okay. inside yeah. con in the instantiation context, and the other will be looked up in the definition context. So they'll actually refer to two different X's. Just like the X is equal Yeah, exactly. But for the person looking at the macro, it's clear that something magic is happening when he sees those dollar signs. It's, it's uh, not like templates where you never know where that X, you know, C++ templates were, the weird lookup rules, you never know what X is going to be grabbed. <laughs> okay, well, this is more by just introducing this. So this is another uh, slide that I introduced, uh, I introduced hastily. Um, what you see is a fragment of a dot product operation, very simple, in which you have, uh, you want to compute uh, the sum of all pairwise products of two vectors. So first elements multiplied plus two second elements multiplied and so on. Um, the nice thing about this is that it's partially unrolled, uh, meaning that I have a for loop that's going to iterate four elements at a time. And inside this for loop that's going to iterate four elements at a time, I also have two smaller static for each loops, loops, which are going to iterate from zero to four. The trick here is that because of the static, this code is going to be actually expanded four times. So it's as if I sat down and, and copied and pasted the code four times here and four times here, right? Uh, what's this gonna give us? Where from? Where from? Is, is this going to give any gain on a one or a single core? OK, here's the $1 million. So single core processor, is this going to give me any gain? No, mm -hmm. sure, yes. Yeah. I'm doing loop on rolling. OK, so it's gonna <laughs> <laughs> depends. <laughs> so it's going to give gains on any superscalar architecture that has an ALU that is capable of doing mul uh, several multiplications at the same time in one thread. So it's going to do well on a single core machine that has a superscalar architecture. And that actually uh, works three point time, uh, times fast, faster than the, the naive version. I actually checked. So it's, it's a very neat feature because it allows you to then play with this branches constant, and it's going to automatically 
expand the loop to be larger or smaller, uh, and you tune it uh, depending on the implementation. Yes? Yes, I'd you'd probably ideally p encapsulate all this into a macro. So a macro would be recursive. It would be tailor recursive if you want to do iteration. But this is very convenient because it, it just, you just want to iterate four times, so, or blank, uh, branches times. Yes? Because if it's, if it's uh, that's a good question. If it's from 0 to 1,000, although you do know the bounds of the loop, you don't always want to unroll it. You know, knowing the bounds does not equal unrolling. You might. It's a good point. And some do. Right. Um, on the other hand, this is an example of uh, use of a static for each. It's not every example of use of static for each. There could be plenty, like I want to define a number of uh, enums, or I want to define, I want to uh, copy some code with small changes, uh, you know, for example, like parsing an enum. You know, there's plenty of examples that do not involve optimization. All right. Um, can we go back and check up the new strings literals? Yeah, okay. Okay, forward one. Okay, um, when you came up with a mix in syntax and domain specific languages, it became really clear that the way to do, way string literals are done in D is inadequate. Um, too many backslashes are needed, too many, uh, um, uh, it's just too much work if you're going to have a complicated string literal. So we basically looked at other languages and came up with uh, three new ways to do string literals. Uh, the first way is, uh, a, de a delimited string literal, it starts with a Q, double quote, and then a character. It, this character is the delimiter, and the delimiters can nest, and it followed by the closing delimiter and the double quote again. And the nesting delimiters are the uh, uh, parenthesis, brace, curly brace, angle bracket, the usual things that nest. If it's not one of those sets, it's just, uh, it's the same character. character. So. That's the first one, and this is really handy for like regular expressions, because you can use the, then the slash syntax for the regular expressions, and um, it looks nice. You don't have to do any funny things or worry about your double quotes screwing you up. So next page. Okay. <laughs> Another thing people do with mixins is they're mixing in D code, because um, they're manipulating D code with mixins. Um, but the problem is decode can have white space, it can have comments, it can have all these other things. So a decode string starts as a Q, um, an open brace, I mean an open curly brace, then a sequence of D tokens followed by a closing curly brace. And this string would be the same as double quote foo, which is not very interesting. But you get into this one, and we'll see the slash star brace, which is inside the comments. So that is not a closing brace for the comment or for the string because it's inside a comment. So really, any lexically valid decode can appear in between the curly braces, and it will skip past them until it finds a matching curly brace. Oop, that question mark shouldn't be there. That should be a, yeah. a brace. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It anyway. doesn't matter, but <laughs> yeah, it still should be a, <laughs> a brace. The question was, will it actually preserve comments? Yes, it will preserve comments, because what it will do, it, the lexer is actually recursively invoked, and it's only used to scan for the close. Once it finds the close, it takes the beginning and end, snips them off, and that becomes a string literal. What? No, it's actually only a few lines of code to do this because it recursively invokes 
the Lexer. And that's the magic to making this work. Oh, that won't work. <laughs> <laughs> you got two years, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it yeah. counts in there. So, but it will also give you an error like for invalid uh, D tokens. So, if you are creating a domain specific language, um, you can uh, use these as long as you stick with make your domain specific language up out of things that are valid D, D tokens. That's uh, very interesting because you're going to have uh, 6,000 lines of code and closed by curly braces. And you look at it, and it all depends on a cube being at the beginning of the first curly brace. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but your syntax highlighter will highlight it all as a comment. All right, good point, good point. You want it highlighted inside? It should be a pastel nuance or something, a slightly different color. How about that? As soon as you put the Q on, oop, <laughs> it turns into a string constant. <laughs> so I'm not totally sure how useful this will be. This is one of those things where um, I've kind of put it out there, and I think it should be useful. Next, um, next one, yeah. The next one is the uh, here doc strings, which is a Q followed by a double quote, followed by an identifier, and then anything between there until that identifier appears again at the beginning of a line becomes part of the comment. Yes, the line will complete line. Beginning of the line. It's just like beginning of the line. And actually I modified this slightly. You have to put the double quote after it too. Okay. And that kind of makes it pair up a little nicer. No, it has to be at the beginning. Um, I'm also working on the end doc thing, which is you would just underscore, underscore, end doc, underscore, underscore. And then you'll be able to terminate your D program with underscore, underscore, EOF, underscore, underscore. And that will tell the parser that I'm done with my D code. Everything after that becomes a string, literal. So what that enables you to do is to take your D code and just using a simple Linux command, the cat command, to cat your data onto it for it to process. So um, like uh, Gregor was talking with him uh, yesterday about uh, his need for a scripting language for his thing. This would make it really easy. You put the D code up here that does the parsing and handles it. And then his DSL, domain specific language, appears is simply appended to it. And the user never has to even look at the D code. They just look at the code that's after the EOF. You look very skeptical. <laughs> uh, this this actually is, a, is in Perl, and they find it very useful there. It, you know, uh, they, they do a lot of documentation that way. Uh, Yeah, but what if you want to use three quotes in the middle? Well, that's, well, you know, if you want to use three yeah. double quotes or three single yeah. quotes. Oh. <laughs> no, that, no, that's, Yeah, so in essence, this is the uh, same power, same power as as uh, as what we have. So you know, the details could could differ. I, I doubt we're gonna find a scheme that looks absolutely beautiful to everybody. You know, as long as we have the functionality there, I think um, you know it's good. Well, but I wanted to have a scheme where you didn't have to check the interior of the thing. 
Okay, I think that's important. You don't have to go check, oh, am I using any double quotes in there? I've got to escape them. I want to just put this stuff in there. <laughs> yeah, you've inserted Python code in there. <laughs> but with the, the here docs, you can always you know, make your identifier longer, and you're pretty much guaranteed that there's never going to be any inadvertent match in it, whatever text you stick in there. So that's it for the new string literal. Next is yours. What? Next is yours. Uh, the return storage class. Uh, in C++, if you have a function that uh, deals with an argument and returns its argument but doesn't modify it, often you'll make that const. And uh, sometimes you want to, and then if you pass that result of that to another function, well, now it's const, even though you didn't want it to be const. If you had a modifiable array, you pass it through this function, and it comes out, it becomes const. And now I can't pass it to another function that takes a modifiable array. And how C++, how they solve this is every function is written twice. You have the version that takes a const argument and returns a const, and the exact same function that takes a non-const argument and returns a non-const value. Um, in D, the problem gets worse because you have invariance, so now you've got You've got to have a function that has a, takes a mutable type, function that takes a const type, function that takes an invariant type. And you can see where this is going. It's a, it's a disaster. Um, so I thought of the idea of just putting a storage class of return for an argument. And what that does is it'll peel whatever const invariant or non-const or whatever that's there and tack it onto the return type. So now you only have to implement the function once instead of having to, you know, dupe the function multiple times for all the variations of const. Okay, the return type's constants depends on the constants of the argument, not the parameter. So this is happening by the compiler when it's calling the function. It doesn't change the inter internals of the function at all. It's only, what is the return type of my function? And uh, the astute observer in the alias of Bartosz <laughs> pointed out, why can't I do this with a template function and uh, specialize based on const or non-const? And uh, you almost can do it, but I realized after I talked to Bartosz about that that uh, template functions cannot be virtual, so it might be a little restricted. And the return, saying return is just a bit of syntactic sugar to just make it easy that that's what you're doing. You yes, you could. The body, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yes, you, you could, but... Um, then you actually are generating multiple copies of the function. This way, there is actually only, there's never more than one copy of the function generated. It's just how its return type is fabricated, not the, not the contents of the function. Um, and I think that's all yeah, um, we have, isn't it? Oh. Um, I suggest we, uh, <clears throat> we stop here, uh, not before asking, uh, you, you know, getting through some, uh, some Q&A uh, section, although you guys have asked a lot of uh, questions and made a lot of great comments uh, during this, uh, this talk. And the other one, I suggest we kind of stop here with, uh, there's just a couple of more, uh, more minor um, features that we didn't cover, uh, but I suggest we, uh, we stop here and we, uh, we get into a kind of uh, ask us anything kind of thing and uh, make your comments. Uh, what do you think? Uh, we'd be extremely interested to hear what, what you guys think. The standard, I, I just put uh, one slide for the standard library because they are not, they are, we don't have a lot of plans yet. Uh, the rough plans are to um, add uh, STL style containers, which are uh, missing. Uh, we believe like ST, that uh, STL is a, is, a sound, uh, is a sound collection of containers and algorithms. 
Um, beyond that, uh, we don't have much of a much of a vision on how the heck are gonna get more time to implement uh, the library. So because you know any library is gonna be a major project, and we we have one on our hands already. We also talked about ranges. We also talked about ranges, which which are kind of these iterators kind of thing. Well, that's also a library issue, Thomas. Timeline, oh, <laughs> that seems to change minute by minute. <laughs> uh, you're, we're keeping him from working right now. <laughs> I can't give a good timeline because every time I have, it's turned out to be wrong. Well, the string literals are nearly all implemented. The rest of the stuff I haven't even started on yet. Const. Yeah, well, except const. Is, there's a current version of const which will change at least slightly from the way it is now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would guess all this may take another full year maybe to implement. That's right. Next year we'll be up here with the future of D and a whole bunch of new stuff. <laughs> Chuck. There's a, a list of projects done in D at, uh, on the, under D links on the website, on the Digital Mars website, including like Deadlock, which was a, a rather major game, uh, first person shooter game done with D, uh, utilizing a lot of uh, the libraries people have made over time that were either converted to D or a D interface was created to them. Um, Now, I don't know of a major corporate project using D that's deployed. I, there are a lot of people using it for grassroots sort of smaller projects in, and um, I think uh, a lot of corporations are wary of D. They want it to prove its salt first, and they'll do that by trying it out on these, you know, just in-house projects. So that's really where it's at right now. No. <laughs> no, if you'd ask, I, I'll bring one tomorrow. <laughs> oh, well, if you give me your address, I'll mail you one. <laughs> yes? <clears throat> Probably not. <laughs> there's, it's not that it's a bad idea or, or whatever, it's just there's too many other things going on. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's going in. Yeah. Yeah, reference is turning into from a storage class to a type modifier. So it would be if it actually types correctly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So instead of, you know, that's why the move from out parameters to ref parameters, because ref is. Uh, plan to be promoted to basically like the C++ ampersand. So. Yeah, well, there are too many other reasonable uses for refs. It's a problem. Yeah, they're not going to go away. It's just they just won't be necessary. In out will still be there. No, I, I made a mistake. The ref replaces the in-out, not the out. 
the fundamental difference between in, out, and out is out parameters are actually default initialized upon the function entry, and in outs are not. It'll be a const ref. The reason I'm asking is sometimes you might just go to a very common case. Yeah. So. Yeah, so the, the plan is to bind in to the most uh, used uh, combination of, of qualifiers. And that's, I'm not sure if ref should be in there for small structs, but probably it's going to be, uh, it's going to include some form of Im immutability. It's just a read only argument. Uh, was the first without, without any yeah, there's going to be a difference okay. yeah in it means something and nothing doesn't mean the same something all right so i guess we can jump to the conclusion here all right <laughs> you wrote that day. slide <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> so should we meet again next year sure. uh, Oh, <laughs> well, you'll have graduated by next year. You do. <laughs> well, it sure is great that you guys have sacrificed, and I know you guys have sacrificed to come here, and that's really, uh, really exciting and gratifying that you've been willing to do that, and that's great. Well, I, I guess I'm speaking on behalf of uh, absolutely everybody here, except Brad, uh, in thanking Brad for everything he's done. Thank you.